We see lots of people coming in. Maybe we wait for some time and then we can start. All right. Hello, everyone, and a very good evening and a warm welcome. Um, I'm Kashmira Shinde. I'm your host for today's event. I'm a researcher at the University of Bremen in the robotics group and also a co-team member of Women in AI and Robotics. Today, I'm humbled to welcome three amazingly inspiring ladies with us. Um, Dr. Christina Wagner is the Vice President Corporate Research at KUKA, and she drives robotics innovation and technology development together with her team. Dr. Tina Hassan is a postdoctoral researcher in AI and robotics at the University of Bremen. And finally, a moderator and speaker for this event is Leo Bazukenberg. She is the Vice President of Women in AI and Robotics, and she is passionate about the mission of closing the gender gap in AI and robotics and demonstrates that through her actions. She's currently responsible for the public relations and outreach programs at the Institute of Robotics and Mechatronics at the German Aerospace Center. We are very honored and grateful to have all of us, all of you with us today. But before we start, here are some housekeeping instructions. Please note that the Zoom meeting is being recorded. It would be appreciated if everyone stays on mute with the videos off for privacy reasons. Uh, today's session will be about 40 minutes long. And after that, we will take questions from the audience through the chat room. Please feel free to post your questions in the chat room. And if you would like to direct it to one of our speakers, then please add the name before the question. Uh, well, with that being said, I think, Leoba, the stage is all yours now. Thank you very much, Kashmira. Um, yes, as Kashmira mentioned, we're recording the session. so. Um, Please make sure that you keep your camera off if you don't want to be on recording or your microphone off if you don't want to be on recording um, and that you accept the recording thing. So welcome. Um, I'm really excited to have all of you here. Um, it's sweltering hot here in Munich and despite the summer weather you made it, um, there's a lot of people here. We have about, I think about 150 registrations. So it's really wonderful and um, thank you. Um, especially also for Kashmira and Sheila for organizing um, this meeting and obviously for Christine, to Christina and Tina for um, being our speakers tonight. Um, I'm Lioba, um, I'm a, a Vice President of Women in AI and Robotics. Um, and most of you know this already, but I'm just reiterating just to make sure that you know why we're here. Um, and because we're a network um, of both experts, um, professionals, and those who want to become experts or professionals in artificial intelligence and robotics. Um, we're working to, towards gender inclusive, ethical, and responsible solutions that benefit society. Um, so pretty short, <laughs> but pretty big statement um, from our side. Um, our mission is to close the gender gaps in AI and robotics and increase female representation and participation. Um, and as you know, we do this through mentorship, we do, um, we have education programs, um, participate in hackathons, accelerator programs, and we also have talks like tonight. So I'm really excited to welcome everybody here. Thank you. Um, I was asked to just uh, quickly also introduce um, my work and background um, because I'm, or one of the reasons is that I'm not a tech expert. Um, and I know that a lot of people in the audience are tech experts, but I also know that a lot of them would like to maybe join, you know, um, as uh, and become tech experts or, you know, change over to technology scene. So I'll uh, uh, just quickly. Um, hopefully you can see my slides now. So does that work, Kashmira? Yes, it works. Great. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to introduce you um, to my work, as I said, but tonight I'm talking as a private person, as uh, a woman in AI, rather as a representative of DLR. Um, so yeah, so I'm talking about science communication and space robotics um, and AI. Um, and I work for the DLR Institute for 
robotics and mechatronics. Um, we're based, uh, the DLR is one of Germany's biggest research institutions, this um, German Aerospace uh, and um, German Aerospace Center. And um, as you can see, um, we're sort of spread all over Germany. There's research institutes all over Germany. Um, and we are based, um, and hopefully you can see that the windows in my way, but you hopefully can, you can see that um, we're based in Oberpfaffenhofen, which is close to Munich. Um, so as I say, German Aerospace Center, about 9,000 employees by now, one of Germany's biggest research and a lot of researchers um, in Germany work there. Um, and for the Institute of Robotics and Mechatronics, which is one of the biggest institutes, uh, which biggest um, institutes of the ZLR, um, there's about 200 scientists and about 100 students working. Um, and it's really um, very special in a way that it's dealing with the whole uh, robotics development chain. So from hardware to software. Um, it's also one of the oldest robotics institutes and um, we have Christina Wagner here from KUKA, so there's some uh, connection there as well um, in developing um, the LVR robot um, like that. We have um, different research domains. I'm sorry, I can't see my own slides anymore. I hope hopefully you can see them. It, it works. Um, no worries. Okay, great. Yeah. So um, there's different um, robotic application domains. Um, <laughs> My Skype keeps on crashing. Sorry, my um. So there's so there's obviously there's space domains like on orbit orbiting, space robot assistance, and planetary exploration robotics. Um, but there's also things closer to Earth, um, which are you know future manufacturing, as you can see, intelligent service robotics, medical and healthcare, you know, very much <laughs> down to us and um, in touch with us with our bodies. Uh, and then there's so-called field robotics, so exploration. Um, so my job is a science communicator. I'm the, I'm the PR person. I'm, I'm telling stories uh, to the public. Um, the public pays uh, our wages in a way, in a sense that um, this is uh, tax-based research. Um, so we have to make sure that the public understands what we're doing. Um, and we have to tell us in a way, um, science communication is, is telling stories in a way that is truthful and that it makes sense and that they're exciting, you know, they're interesting. Um, but also they have to be they have to be absolutely accurate and truthful. And as scientists, we know that this, this is often not really the case because you know stories might not really be close by this point. We don't really know significant how significant things are. Um, and um, you know, sometimes scientists have to say, well, we don't really know how exciting this is at this point, but we still want to get it across as a as a good story. Um, I do want to show you two examples of um of stories that we had recently that were very successful that we were able to, to transmit to the public in a way that that the public understood and the public got excited about as well um, as well as having you know being really successful um, experiments for the for the institute itself themselves um, and I'm really happy to say that one of the leading scientists is here tonight as well <laughs> in the audience um, because I'm talking now about the Metron experiment where um, that a humanoid robot you see there, Roland Justin, was controlled by um, Alexander Gerst. Um, you can kind of recognize him from the back. Um, um, he controlled um, Roland Justin from the ISS. Um, so from space, he uh, from the International Space Station, he steered him. He made him do certain jobs. Um, there were even some surprises. We sort of faked an emergency situation, and um, Roland Justin carried out all these tasks. Um, um, on Earth, obviously, in our in our laboratories, um, and part of our job as researchers, as communicators, was to transmit the story in a way that that you know, that, as I say, is exciting, is truthful, um, and we you know we had a YouTube live broadcast, and um, that was really popular. Um, a lot of you know you can see a lot of TV teams were there, and uh, we had international coverage, um, really from Reuters to Spiegel to Zeit, um, a lot of international media, um, and that was you know, a lot of fun for us and it was really a successful um, experiment and we had a lot of feedback from the public as well, you know, from little children who get excited to, to you know, all the people and it's that's a lot of fun and that's a really, um, I think, also a great source of encouragement for our scientists as well, when you really um, are able to transmit the excitement about science um, 
through experiments like that. Um, something closer to Earth uh, is uh, our care assistance uh, robotics project. Um, this is something that I'm personally very uh, passionate about as well. Um, we know in Germany that we have a huge care gap. Um, so there's, there are simply not enough carers to go around. And I think it's an incredibly important subject. Um, it will probably concern all of us in some way, or it will concern our family members. Um, we will want you know, um, our elderly people or people who, you know, with some disabilities to be looked after um, in in the best way we can, really. Um, so there is this care assistance uh, project. Um, you can see that a robot Eden, that's sort of electrical wheelchair Eden. Um, this is an able-bodied uh, researcher who's sitting in there. So that's, this is not a person um, who uh, who is usually in a wheelchair, um, but she's controlling this wheelchair um, in, in the new experiments on the picture, she isn't actually, but she's uh, controlling with EMG technology, so with some uh, with muscle signals. Um, and this, and even people with, um, you know, with uh, illnesses like muscle um, muscular dystrophy, um, can still control this electric wheelchair. And this is really a big, big change to their life. Um, being able to be more in independent is all about independence, all about being autonomous. It's all about being able to control your own life, not having to ask for help, not having to ask for, you know, assistance all the time. Um, but, um, and you know, she's pouring a drink and things like that. But when it comes to care and when it comes to dealing with people on that close level, it's, it's not just about technical assistance as it's about a whole lot more it's also about you know you know it's about human interaction and there's a there's a lot of um debate in the public and this is something that we as press people have to deal with a lot as well um about about ethics about you know what does that mean you know will the robot just brush my teeth and i don't even really want that or you know what's going on there you know um do i just have to talk to a robot now you know maybe i want to have a human carer instead so there are a lot of fears um there are a lot of questions and there's also a lot of expectations you know we have people contact us and say like well you know i'm probably going to die in five years could you give me a robot now to help me now and and this is also like this is this is a really tough situation uh, for people to be in and to say well actually this is this is a development project you know um, so there's so what I'm what I'm trying to say really is that this is a huge story for the public um, it affects all of us and it requires a huge deal of of sensitivity really um, of preparation of trying to ask um, the right questions um, and trying to deal with it. Um, this is also a point where I want to cut off talking about my work because I was asked to um, to talk to you um, because, um, about my personal journey because as I said earlier, I'm obviously I'm not a tech person. I have very little tech understanding actually um, and and I don't have tech background at all, um, sadly. Um, I'm what is called in Germany a Quereinsteiger. So I think that's called a lateral entrant in, in, in English. So somebody who basically changed careers um, halfway through. Um, and as I say, I know that a lot of people in the audience are experts, but we also have a lot of questions from people who want to join the tech scene and who might be insecure and who might not know what their way about is. So I thought I'd just share my journey quickly and, and see what I learned and, you know, um, things that I might not repeat or things that that just didn't turn out to be true also. Um, so I'm a trained journalist uh, and I'm a political scientist. And to make matters even worse, I'd studied political philosophy. So it's an incredibly narrow field. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's really as far as you can get from practical tech development in a way as you as you can imagine. You know, it's, it's really far away from that, at, at least initially. Oh, that's what I thought. Um, and it's really also where a lot of my personal fears and insecurities come from when, you know, when I see people construct stuff and, you know, um, so I'm really far away from that. And um, before I started my job at the DLR, um, I thought I had my career all figured out, right? I was at university, I was a journalist, you know, I was a lecturer for, for journalism and political science. So, so that was all, you know, figured out. And I didn't, I kind of, you know, when you're in your mid-30s, you kind of start knowing what you're all about and knowing what you know and, and kind of figuring out that, you know, some stuff I can do and you, you some, some, somehow get a security. But then some, something happened um, and we all know that life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. <laughs> so this is what happened to me. Um, and um, something really turned my world upside down and that was that I had two children 
and I realized I couldn't follow my path as, as this, you know, traveling academic uh, anymore, you know, it just wouldn't work out. Um, and so society's perception also changed of me, you know, can she really handle this project, you know, can she do this, uh, you know, she's a mother of two small, small children, so for me, everything got turned upside down, and I didn't know anything anymore, um, and I couldn't pursue my career, um, and I had to find a plan B. So my plan B um, was working as a PR professional, and um, with a great deal of luck, I ended up at the Institute for Robotics and Mechatronics, um, and that meant really starting anew, you know? Anybody and everybody there from those 300 people knew more than I did. <laughs> I felt at least at this point about it. I had to question everything. I didn't know I didn't know anything anymore. Um, and I literally, in a sense, I felt like I had to learn a new language. Um, and I give you one example. Um, we we talk when when you talk about robots moving things, you talk about robotic manipulation, right? So you know it's manipulation. Obviously, to, to me as a political scientist, you know, when you're manipulating things or when manipulation, that's a big term, you know, and that's not the type of term we, that we use. And I just mentioned the care, project, uh, care robotics project, you know, we don't want to say like, oh, so the robot now is manipulating the elderly <laughs> people or something like that. That's, that's not what we want to say. Um, and, um, and it was with, with those kind of discussions, so finally, the kind of things that were the most alien to me. Um, that I started to, 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 to see, well, actually, I have an outside point of view, you know, let's talk about this. Let's talk about the words that you use. Let's talk about degrees of freedom. Let's talk about what does that even mean, you know? And, um, and, we, and those weaknesses um, became, in a way, a strength, or it became what made me different. Um, and the colleagues were really open to discussion, um, which is, you know, I think that that was really the basis that people are open to listening and are open to interdisciplinarity and true interdisciplinarity and understanding that, um, you know, more viewpoints make a project stronger <laughs> uh, um, and make it less prone to failure, make it less pro, you know, make it more applicable, make it, uh, you know, make it makes it makes it better in a way. Um, and, you know, and the team ended up pushing, um, pushing ethics, publishing stuff about ethics. Um, then the team ended up being invited by the German Ethics Council, so Deutsche Ethikrat. Um, we ended up in some, you know, think tanks. And, um, and now with the encourage encouragement of the management, I can even do like a little research again. So I can even go back into my, you know, so for me, it's in a sense that was like a whole circle going back into academia, researching science communication, researching ethics, you know, things like that. Um, even though that wasn't part of the job description at all at first. So really, the, the skills that you have, they stay with you. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. Um, and, you know, and I picked up an awful lot on the way as well. <laughs> a lot of, 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 of knowledge of, of things that you question yourself and some really awesome, um, cool colleagues. Um, so I'm not trying to summarize the sort of lessons that I had. Um, as a young mother and somebody who's changing career at the same time, I felt I had like no proper place in the world anymore. I really felt lost. Everything I knew that was true about me or about, you know, my place wasn't true anymore. Um, I felt like I had this double negative whammy in a way, right? Um, I think a lot of new mothers don't know, you know, feel, feel like their world is being turned upside down. Um, and I think society will make you question, you know, if you have to choose between children and your career or, or, or at least a career that fulfills you, you know? Um, I was extremely lucky to find a friend, very, very family-friendly employer. So the deal, I think, is well known for that. And I was really lucky to find that. But I think they are out there. So if, if, you, want, uh, if you want an employer to take you seriously and to, you know, and, and, you know I think you, you can articulate these things. And uh, there are employers out there who, who find it, you know, who, who understand how, how important it is to be family-friendly. We see this has been even more so with corona. You know, we know that women took, took care of a lot of the children a lot of the time. And I think this is something that employers increasingly we have to face. You know, they have to, you know, women are really valuable workforce and um, with women comes childcare uh, in, in a lot of times. Um, so, so that was the first thing I, I, I learned. Um, the second thing was my idea about skills, right? I did, I don't have technical skills, as I said, and, um, 
I felt like I had to take really small steps, take on a different role and it's a different, take on a different route, but you will get there. You will, you know, you still stay, your skills stay with you. And I think that we as non-technical people or as non-techies, we have skills to contribute. And I, I talked earlier about the mission statement of, of women in AI. And I think diversity is really something that I believe makes us better. And, and it means, um, and I think when it comes to new developments or new, new inventions or you know, tech developments, um, in order to make them more accurate, to make them more universal applicable, um, we need to be diverse. Um, a visual recognition software that only recognizes half of the world's population because the other half has the wrong color, that's not good, you know? Um, it's, it's, we need to think outside, well, I don't even want to say outside, the box because we are the box you know the box is really big and it's really diverse and it includes you know how you know half of the world are women you know not everybody's um, able-bodied not everybody is white and easily readable perhaps um you know um, some people are old some people are young it's it's you know that's that's what we are and and you know to create anything just for a particular group that's just not good enough when it comes to when it comes to invention when it comes to technology that is having such a big impact on on our life and on our society. Um, they say it takes a village to raise a child. I'm coming back to the child. Um, and obviously that means it takes all sorts of people to, to raise, you know, to, to, to educate a child, right? So you have the parents, you have the grandparents, you have all sorts of life experiences, you have all sorts of um, input um, to, to raise this child. And I actually think it also takes a village to build a good robot. Um, so our contribution is valid, and I think we should just go for it. So that's really my two cents. Um, but now we are really lucky to have <laughs> to have a I was always going to say proper tech person, so somebody who really um, knows a lot about technology, who's leading in innovation, who's leading research for KUKA, um, something which is also very much uh, very close to application. Um, you know, it has to, you know, KUKA has to go out there soon as a commercial company. So I'm really, really interested and glad uh, to hear uh, Christina uh, Wagner talk about her journey and her research. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Leobard, for this great introduction. Um, I have also prepared some slides and um, I will start with my personal journey and then dive into the topics I'm, I'm pushing and driving uh, with KUKA. So give me a minute. And I think these, um, if, if I can quote you, you said that the skill set you have will stay with you and this is an Oh, now I have the problem you had, guys. I can't believe that. So I, th I think you see the presentation mode, right? Um, just give me a second. Yes. yes I change it. Mode. Yeah. I change it just a second. Um, yes, now it's fine for us. And then let's go like that. Now it's better, right? Okay. So um, the skills that you have will stay with you. This was this is actually a very good um, start to my career. So um, um, I don't want to go into all the details, but what is important for me is to emphasize that there were three things which were sort of driving my personal career, and this is of course on the one hand uh, this uh, private person interest and and the private development, uh, which, which is this gray line. Uh, what what was very much driving me as a individual was um, this this interest in learning new things, and you will see it during my whole career that I always try to to um, take a new challenge and to uh, to see the world and and also technical um, questions from different perspectives. This was driving me a lot during my career. Um, I I studied mathematics. Um, in Aachen, and um, I was always very passionate about algebra because um, this is, so one of our professors said that uh, mathematics and algebra is, is the art of thinking. And I, I like this, this quote a lot. Um, um, it influences a lot the way you are thinking and, and you try to solve problems. Um, 
I, I did my PhD in algorithmic, um, in algebraic system theory, which is uh, motivated by automation control. So when you have simple automation control equations, differential equations, then you have a specific um, structure in the solution space. And this kind of structure um, has a, a direct um, translation into, um, into um, system um, capabilities like um, having a controllable or a observable system. And as soon as you take some of this um, specific um, structure of the, of the system equations away, then you lose structure. And, and my PhD was actually deep diving on what kind of impact would this have been. And, and um, at that time, also um, um, computing so so um, um, was was very um, yeah a very important um, new let's say new um, instrument in in mathematics to do this symbolic computing and this is where I also did some uh, or programmed some libraries. Um, when I was done with my PhD, I discovered sort of, um, I don't want to stay my whole life in academia. I'm too interested in how the real tech world um, does work like. And I started my professional career in, in consulting, which was very much focusing on, on technology consulting. So um, with a big corporate technology department. And there, um, since we, since we, had the the task to to um, do the technology transfer of different technologies and also work together with uh, various um, R and D and and product management departments. Um, the the knowledge about methodologies was very important, and I sort of discovered the power of of methodology. You you have. Um, and also all these frameworks you have when, when pushing innovation was pretty new for me. And it's a very powerful instrument if you try to orchestrate a big innovative undertaking because beside the pure science aspect and the technical aspect, you always have a market which is requiring specific um, features and you need to orchestrate in a way that you have also a continuous revenue flow, right? So this was, this was um, very interesting for me to learn and understand. And um, I did to 2015, I joined KUKA. Um, I knew KUKA since my times um, in academia where I um, worked and at the Institute of Automation Control. And I was always very um, delighted about the KUKA products and robotics. Um, and within KUKA, I had different functions. Um, till I actually started the job I'm working now in, where I would say it's it's like the best and greatest um, opportunity and, and, and task I ever had in my professional career. And I will talk about that one later um, in a minute. There's just one additional remark. Um, beside this aspect of technology, um, finding the, the appropriate um, views on the technological product view, the go-to-market view, what, what came into, into this um, tech world in addition via digitalization is um, user experience and ecosystem. It was there for sure uh, even before, but it became much, much more powerful. And, and when, when heading this innovative project, I will talk about now, um, I also understood how important it is to, to um, build also in this perspective when you are designing your platform or product. And what we are actually doing um, in KUKA is to, to redefine or reshape our robot experience. And um, we have this high, high level vision, our vision 2030 saying that um, in 2030, everybody who wants to use KUKA robots should be able to do so. 
uh, we will still be in this, just to make it clear, we are in the production environment and we are automating production lines. And this will, this will remain true, but um, we want to broader um, the users and we also want to broader the companies we are supporting and automating their tasks. And in order to do so, we have um, kicked off two and a half years ago now this program, the robot experience, which does have the purpose to, on the one hand, um, design a new architecture, which is flexible enough, and this is important, flexible enough to react fast on market requirements, but also um, is, is capable and robust enough um, for technological trends we do see now, and we, we also see them being very important in the future. So beside um, various um, sensor technologies, for instance, or AI technologies, we also, of course, um, see that we have a different kind of, of um, user behavior and expectations from our clients. Um, since everybody of us is using a smartphone, for instance, we are very much used to, to interact with technical devices differently. And um, also the way we are learning to interact with those devices changed over the past years. So um, most of the people are not any longer interested in, in joining a longly training, for instance. Or, um, or reading very longly documents. So usually what they do is they watch a YouTube tutorial um, and, and they are working in communities to start quickly. Of course, what you can achieve there is just, just a limited thing, sure. So complex tasks re remain complex and you will always need a, a specific view for experts extending your robot systems, um, which, which does not um, try to hide complex things, but supports to, to also conduct complex tasks quickly and fast. And this is the goal of, of, of our robot experience, having as a foundation, a new operating system, and upon this operating system, an ecosystem of partners, on the one hand, third party providers, which are of course extending your robot uh, via cameras, via grippers, uh, also uh, specialized software that can be extended upon the system. And we also of course want to further um, investigate in a big community of developers further developing our system. So you, you can compare it when you do some pattern matching in, in tech revolutions we saw in the past. Then you could compare it to, to what we saw in the computer industry when um, we had the shift coming from mainframe to personal computers where computers started to be affordable. So the hardware started to be affordable. But in addition, um, due to a new operating system, it was possible for non-experts to interact with the devices. And so this was one aspect, usability for different kinds of users, of course. And um, due to the usage of standardized interfaces and technologies, you open up the, the community of developers that are able to extend your system, which is also very crucial if you want to scale fast and onboard functionality fast to your system. And this is the purpose of our IQCA system. Um, we are now at the point that we will, we will launch, so we have announced um, this, this new software platform, um, two or three months ago, and we will have the first products with the new software stack beginning of next year. And this is actually the, so I was asked to, to talk about what are like the most challenging and exciting steps in my professional career. So for sure, this is the most challenging and exciting thing to, to be able to shape the future of robotics with KUKA. So this is 
this is actually um, what I wanted to share with you guys. Thank you very much. That was really, um, I don't know, I don't want to say visionary because it seems so uh, overused that word, but it was. Um, so I'm, and I'm really excited to talk to you um, uh, later after Tina's talk and find out some more um, about your vision for 2030. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, but, um, it's, um, it's a bit pleasure that I now introduce the scientist to this round, which is uh, uh, Dr. Tina Hassan, who's working for the University of Bremen, and she's sharing her research with us and also um, let us take part, her, part in her journey. Yeah, thank you, Lioba. So, um, yeah, so now I'm the expert from the academia, so you can also expect a slightly academic presentation. <laughs> So uh, let me share my screen. Yes, uh, I hope you see my screen now. Yeah, so uh, first of all, thank you uh, to Women in AI and Robotics for having me here today. So um, I'm happy to share my personal journey in the fields of AI and robotics with you. So I was born in Kerala, India, and um, as a child, I, I realized quite early that I like uh, analytical thinking and logic appealed to me especially so much. And uh, that uh, made me like computer science. And the I was um, 10 years old when I saw a computer for the first time. And since then, um, yeah, it has uh, aroused the curiosity in me to understand how does it work and how does it uh, know what to do and how can I tell it what it should do? So um, that's how it started. And um, I um, therefore studied computer science and computer science related topics throughout my um, academic uh, uh, stage and um, yeah so uh, I did my bachelor's in computer science and engineering um, and after graduation I worked as a software engineer in the telecommunication and data communication domains um, as part of Wipro technologies and um, during that time I got uh, engaged in certain nonprofit initiatives uh, related to um, education and um, yeah, I wanted to continue uh, my studies and um, yeah, I uh, was interested in pursuing it abroad because that would also help me broaden my perspectives about education as such. And um, yeah, so I came to Germany and I finished my master's in autonomous systems at uh, the uh, bonn rhein sieg University of Applied Sciences. And during that time, um, I started working for a project which used uh, social robots to uh, study uh, emotional arousal in um, persons with dementia. And that was kind of a turning point for me. And um, I always liked using uh, technology for um, as, uh, an assistive uh, system to aid uh, people with um, uh, yeah, people who are differently abled, um, for example, and uh, this was a turning point and I started my research in automatic facial expression analysis. And this research I later continued at the Fraunhofer Institute for Integrated Circuits in Erlangen. And during my time there, I also started my PhD as an external uh, doctoral candidate at the University of Bamberg. And that was another uh, turning point because there I met uh, Professor Ute Schmid. She was my um, PhD advisor and she is one of the strongest mentors uh, that I have in Germany. And um, yeah, she has been there throughout my journey and uh, even now continues to guide me and advise me on key uh, research related aspects. So um, at Fraunhofer IIS, um, I later uh, moved on uh, to become a senior scientist where I was responsible for research project acquisitions in machine learning, social robotics, um, and affective computing. 
Um, I received my doctoral degree uh, last year, and in the meantime, I had uh, started working um, at uh, Bielefeld University as a research associate. And there my focus was on uh, social human robot interaction, and I was responsible for developing a cognitively inspired uh, architecture that would enable robots to exhibit lively behaviors and also explain its own behaviors to the uh, user. So as to obtain more transparency into uh, the black box called the robot. So, yeah, um, presently I am a postdoctoral researcher in the robotics group at the University of Bremen. And um, I continue to focus on human robot interaction, but uh, certain specific aspects of it, especially understanding humans, um, enabling robots to learn uh, from uh, human feedback and uh, to model uh, human robot interaction episodes. So uh, the project that I am related uh, to right now, so um, I'm contributing to uh, is uh, in the field of human robot interaction in uh, space missions of the future where robots are supposed to uh, assist astronauts uh, in planetary and deep space exploration missions. And I'm also, um, a core team volunteer of Women in AI and Robotics Germany. And currently I'm also the city lead for its uh, Bremen chapter. So that is the journey. And maybe I can manage to give you a short uh, glimpse into some of the research that I have done. So the key part of my PhD work was on facial expression analysis. That is to say, uh, we developed a framework that can estimate uh, intensities of uh, 22 different facial muscle movements. So <laughs> this is something that we all come across every day. Um, so uh, I mean, yeah, we communicate with our faces. So we show emotions, we com communicate our mental states, we, we have other um, communicative intents that uh, might have specific meanings which uh, the interaction partner might uh, be able to decode. So um, facial expressions form an important nonverbal uh, communication modality and um, yeah, the work uh, I did uh, tried to model expressions in a in an objective way. Uh, that's um, so. Uh, for this, uh, we used uh, different types of information. So we use models of facial shape uh, deformations, uh, models of facial appearance changes, and uh, models of facial muscle dynamics, and uh, combined all of them in a state estimation framework that then produced these intensities. So you can see here a plot uh, showing a, a lady uh, smiling and the, the plot is the output from the system. And a, a happy smile or a pleasant smile involves two uh, movements. So it, may, it involves uh, pulling the lip corners upwards and raising the cheek. So if you see that the racing of cheek is not a part of a smile, then yeah, it's probably not a genuine smile and, and rather a social smile. Uh, so um, yeah, so here you can see the development of the smile over time. And so the system can be used for analyzing facial expressions uh, and their temporal uh, characteristics. And that was important for um, analyzing and studying uh, pain and uh, stress in humans. So um, robotic systems uh, that work with humans or interact with humans uh, need this capability to understand uh, human behavior and uh, facial expressions therefore, uh, and so understanding facial expressions is therefore one way in which um, the robots can do this. And this brings me to the next part of my research, um, which was done at the University of Bielefeld. And uh, yeah, here you see that uh, for a social robot or any robot to interact with the human, perception or understanding facial expressions is not enough. 
So it needs to have additional cognitive capabilities, like it should have the capacity to memorize events, to, to uh, extract knowledge. It should have the capability to make decisions that are best suited for the current uh, situation. It should have the capacity to automatically plan uh, the sequence of actions that would enable the robot to achieve its goal. And it should also have the capacity to um, generate, schedule, and control its uh, physical actions. And um, yeah, so you can see that um, a robot is uh, a system that combines or requires uh, the integration of uh, methods and models from different fields of artificial intelligence and computer science. So here, um, in this case, I can state, for example, computer vision, natural language understanding, sequential decision making, knowledge representation, automated planning, path planning. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, such technologies that go uh, into a robot. And um, yeah, so, uh, so robots are systems that integrate these different uh, AI methods and they are also a form of embodied uh, AI systems. So that means they are, uh, so they are uh, systems that exist and operate in physical environments and they view and make decisions based on their own uh, egocentric perceptual inputs. And uh, when they act in the environment, these inputs change. So uh, they kind of learn uh, through their embodied physical interactions with the environment and with the uh, other agents in the environment. So um, yeah, so that's how I would relate robotics and AI together. And uh, yeah, so my present work uh, at the University of Bremen is also in this uh, related to this field, but focuses on certain human centered aspects. So um, I work on fields, uh, topics related to perception and understanding of human behavior and modeling human robot interaction episodes in learning from human input or human feedback and in um, explaining robot behavior to humans. And this uh, also requires systems and methods that are uh, aware of the uncertainties associated with the perceptions and the models. It requires methods that are sensitive to the privacy requirements of humans, uh, system methods that are um, aware of the different dimensions of human diversity, and systems that can adapt uh, to the preferences of the user. Um, so um, there, this is a, a big field and it is uh, interdisciplinary uh, and um, requires collaboration between multiple research teams to, to uh, realize something like this. And um, at the EU level, there is already a, a project uh, that is going on uh, that is called Humane AI, and that focuses specifically on human-centered artificial intelligence, which covers these and many more other aspects. So uh, yeah, so my work right now is to uh, acquire projects related to these topics and establish uh, collaborations between different research institutions. Um, yeah, so I find uh, this work in uh, robotics quite exciting because when you develop artificial autonomous agents, you get to understand the natural ones better. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you very much, Tina. That was really interesting. Um, uh, very quick journey through all your research. And I have so many questions <laughs> about every little detail um, that I'm afraid we, we won't be able to cover today. Um, but I do have an immediate question. And I think I start off with Tina. But a similar question is actually going out to Christina as well, um, who, who told us earlier about her vision on, on 2030 and in a sense almost, I guess I would say almost democratizing robotics um, by saying that very little training is needed um, to be able to use them um, and so making them more accessible to people. Um, and uh, Tina, you were talking about, you, you know, you're, you're being aware that there's certain uncertainty that 
that there is an amount of uncertainty in life, that there is um, there are so many different dimensions that robots have to deal with. And I'm wondering, um, we talk about, you know, malicious use of robotics, uh, you know, using robots for bad, um, which which can happen. And, and and I think that's really something, at least that's my opinion, I, maybe you have a different opinion, that, that you know, if people want to use something for bad, then they can. And I don't think that's up to the tech, tech developers um, in, in a way. You know, you can use a hammer to construct a shelter for, for people or you can use it to hit somebody. So I don't think that's something that is up to us, the tech, tech developers. So at least that's my personal opinion. But we also have unintended consequences. And I'm just, uh, sort of, uh, I was thinking about unintended consequences the other day because we finally got a robot that cleans, you know, just a hoovering robot. And we talked a lot about, you know, privacy issues. And I talked to my colleagues, you know, what kind of data do they send and what kind of sensors and what kind of cameras and do they, you know, uh, broadcast audio, do they broadcast to the, you know, internet. So we talked a lot about malicious use um, and then we finally got this hoover and all of a sudden our kitchen was really, really dirty and it was covered in crumbs all the time. And we we're wondering why, you know, does the robot just drag it around? You know, what's not working? We, we hoovered it up and worked fine. And then all of a sudden it was covered in, in, you know, in sort of brand flakes again, all the time, these brand flakes. And we we're wondering, you know, whenever we looked at it, it was fine. And eventually we found out that the reason why our kitchen was covered in brand flakes was that my children were feeding the robot. You know, they were giving it food to, to eat, to hoover up. And obviously, so, you know, throwing a lot of bran flakes on the floor in, in, you know, in effect, making the kitchen dirtier than it was. So then, so that's an example of unintended consequences of using this robot. So we ended up in, with a worse situation in a way than before. Uh, and I'm wondering, um, you know, how can tech developers ever think of these unintended consequences? Because the clues in the name, they're unintended, you know, you can't, you know, you can't anticipate them. How do you deal with that kind of questions? Or with those kind of ideas? Yeah. So, yeah, it's uh, interesting. Um, so, um, I know from the social robotics research that humans have a tendency to anthropomorphize anthropomorphize uh, technology, so especially robots, because they are active, so they share the same physical space and they become like um, a friend, a mate. Uh, so I also, my, I also had similar experiences with my neighbors who also had uh, such stories to tell about uh, vacuum cleaners, suddenly it went missing, oh, I don't know where it is, as if a pet had run away. So um, yeah, these, um, so it's just uh, we humans are very creative and we fantasize a lot so um, it is from a research perspective it is difficult to cover um, all these consequences so we have to lay focus on what is the most important aspects of the technology that have to be uh, investigated uh, so most often it is uh, security is of primary concern when it comes to robots that uh, share uh, space with humans. And um, yeah, and uh, focus is also on the task uh, that is to be performed and how effectively that can be performed. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, it of course, uh, there is also a focus on the ethical aspects, so, uh, as in um, what to do with the personal data. Uh, is there a risk and um, how do we protect um, the privacy of the uh, users? So these are the, uh, these are kind of the uh, main focuses in research, but uh, yeah, so, um, and uh, these consequences that you mentioned, these are also quite hard to study empirically because <laughs> you, uh, it, it um, uh, differs from uh, each uh, household to another. And um, yeah, so uh, in some cases, but I would say that in, in social uh, robo human robot interaction or, or interaction studies in general, um, there is a deficit in uh, studies that look at long-term interaction. So um, the the uh, so research projects run with a very uh, short time frame of three years, and in that uh, time you have specific things to do, and you cannot have um, uh, long-term uh, studies that often. So um, maybe if we manage to have this. Um, 
um, it would uh, bring more insights into such interesting consequences. So uh, there is some effort in that direction by building living labs and so on that look at these uh, aspects. Uh, but uh, yeah, it is uh, gaining momentum and I hope that in the future, more uh, long-term uh, inter uh, human-robot interaction studies will come out and we can hopefully get to see such effects on an empirical level. Thank you, Tina. Thank you ever so much. Um, Christina, what, you know, what kind of questions do you ask yourself when you develop your robots? Um, um, when it comes to, you know, obviously I don't want to ask how can you do it, but what kind of questions do you ask yourself surrounded unintended consequences? Um, so, okay. So, um, unintended consequences, just trying to, to match uh, your question to our standard um, use case, because of, of course we, we have this, this um, production lines where we automate. So this is um, the, the main uh, field where we, where we um, um, sell our robots. And um, referring to what Tina said is, um, of course, um, safety aspects are uh, prior first but when i try to 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 anticipate maybe more in, into the future um, maybe what you had in mind uh, i assume you had in mind when asking this question is what, what what we actually see is that there's also a certain group of of users or customers who explore with our robots automation demands and this is not um fully uh, predictable because we don't know in the beginning what kind of automation um, potential they want to um, explore and this is this is um, something we we try also to talk to consider a lot what kind of additional help services we can um, we can offer for instance and and what kind of um, yeah, let's say use cases we we can we can maybe even interactively include into um, into guide our um, customers. So in a long term vision, I would even say that um, the best would be that that uh, via um, semantic structuring of 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 the program code we could we could actively give feedback to our customers saying. Um, comparing to to um, what um, eighty percent of of equal applications were doing, I I would suggest to to re reorder um, your objects, for instance. So it's not something we 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 have in in short term or mid term, but this would be one of of our visions, how to how to handle. Um, Un unpredictable and un undefined uh, scenarios. Thank you. I have another question for you because I know that you uh, have to leave now as well, um, but I do have a final question from the audience and uh, it's to do with motion planning. And the question is, um, how can one implement AI methods in the industry when uh, methods like uh, motion planning <clears throat> or similar aren't actually wanted that much at the moment because one doesn't know what the robot is. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, what, because it's not so predictable what the robot is doing um, when using motion planning. Does that make sense? Is it a question for me or? Um, yeah, it's, I, it's I for can, you. Sorry, it's for yeah, you, Christina. I, yeah. I can, I can uh, say something to that one. So, so I think um, motion, so I would assume this, this question refers to to uh, the extension of, of the robot via vision and and uh, further sensors where you can um, where you can um, actively um, um, plan your motion depending on on the environment and and your uh, environmental model you observe. So um, there, I think it's um, it's a very um, common and and powerful use case where we also already see i mean it's in dlr but also in other areas and even in products we do see first uh, features um, coming into the market 
Thank you very much. Um, I know that Christina will have to leave us now. So thank you ever so much for taking the time, you know, sharing your research experiences with us, sharing your journey with us. Um, and um, it was really inspirational. And I'd love to, you know, pick your brain more, you know, find out more of the things that you mentioned. Um, I believe Tina can stay on with us. Um, so, so thank you very, very much uh, to Christina. Yeah, it, it was I a pleasure. We, so really um, and also to get to uh, get to know you Tina and Leoba it's really great and I hope we can keep uh, uh, keep uh, being in touch right thank you yes great ciao thank you Christina ciao thank you, thank you ever so much Bye. thanks bye um Tina I believe that you can um you can stay on um yeah uh, for one more question um we we had a question from the audience um also um, about what, in your opinion, is the best way to master the entry level into the professional work in robotics field, in the robotics field. Um, so what's the lesson learned? Uh, how, how would you uh, master the entry um, into the robot robotics field? Mm, well, uh, I think uh, robotics is, um, I mean, it, it is an interdisciplinary field, so you can approach it from different directions. So. Um, uh, if it is the technical uh, part or the development of uh, robots or technologies for robot that is uh, intended, then yes, you need to have some background uh, in uh, technology, computer science, electronics, mechatronics, and uh, so on. Um, yeah, uh, um, so robots, uh, for me, they are interesting because uh, they bring all of these uh, disciplines together. So as a computer scientist, you find something to do. As a mechanical engineer, you will have something to contribute in the form of designing the robot. Mm, uh, as a um, yeah, mechatronics uh, engineer, you would have uh, the chance to design the electronics uh, that uh, have to go onto the robot. Because especially because robots are mobile, uh, most so more, at least mobile robots are mobile, and um, they uh, also have uh, resource constraints. Um, you can't have a heavy uh, computing power moving around. Um, yeah, so this, the that uh, there, so you can contribute in that way um, as a sociologist or, or um, a psychologist. You can study the the uh, in impact uh, of uh, robots on humans. So how or how do hum uh, people uh, perceive robots? How do they uh, treat them and how do they uh, interact with them? So there are, uh, there is something like robo psychology, I think that looks at uh, this aspect. Um, yeah, uh, there are a lot of ethical questions that are related to it. So, um, and um, especially now uh, with GDPR and uh, so on in, in enforced, um, there is um, also a lot of ways in which uh, lawyers can contribute to lo uh, robotics. So um, I think if you want to enter uh, into the field of robotics uh, first, I mean, you should have an idea or a perspective on which of these areas is interesting to you. So for me, it was clear that I am a computer scientist and what I can do is to program and create software for the robot. So therefore my work um, has always been in that uh, area. So, um, and we had uh, other, um, project colleagues who then took care of um, the hardware design and uh, the hardware and software integration and who uh, people who studied uh, the human robot interaction uh, from a psychological perspective and so on. So yeah, so you have to choose a field and then um, uh, acquire the basic knowledge about that field. So you should have that competence and then uh, you can apply to uh, robotics. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, Tina. We have, um, we have a quite a few questions for you still, but um, we're running out of time, unfortunately. There's one question, though, um, that we, we still have time for, um, if you could maybe um, quickly answer that. Um, 
it's um, in the case of robots and social interaction, are there topics in which you would suggest robots not having a face? Um, for example, interacting with old people or children, um, maybe people with dementia, I don't know. Mm. Yeah, I mean, face, uh, it depends on how you define face. If it, uh, if it, I, I think social robots do not have to look like uh, humans. Uh, so most of the cases, um, they have an abstract shape, but uh, for since we associate, uh, yeah, sociality with, <laughs> so face is an important part uh, um, of uh, social behavior. So um, having a, something like a cartoonish uh, form for a robot is often uh, welcome. And um, Tam, I think there, there were these uh, tamagotchis, uh, these small uh, things that looked like animals and it had <laughs> needs and you had to feed it and stuff like that. So that kind of showed that uh, such uh, forms are accepted. And um, yeah, I have reviewed a lot of robotics, uh, social robotics papers, and uh, you often come across robots that take such fancy shapes. So it can be look like a teddy bear sometimes, uh, but it has eyes and it has what looks like a nose or a mouth. And um, yeah, but it has uh, um, also maybe uh, <laughs> long arms, which are out of proportion maybe for when you compare to a real life uh, bear. <laughs> so, um, so yes, um, a face I think is important, but the face need not have all the complexities that a human face has. So um, um, just, uh, yeah, having uh, something that represents uh, um, so, yeah, a, a face in an abstract way is uh, good, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. There's a lot of more questions coming in and I, I'm afraid we don't have time today, um, but we would invite everybody to have a quick look at our website, uh, womeninairobotics.de, so DE for Germany, womeninairobotics.de. Um, you could become a member um, or you could just, you know, check out what kind of uh, events we've got going on um, and uh, you know get involved in the community um, maybe contribute with your knowledge contribute with your um, expertise and uh, yeah so thank you ever so much for joining us thank you very very much tina um, yeah thank you all <laughs> and uh, i'd like to give a special thank you again to kashmira who uh, hosted uh, this really graciously who organized everything um, and to Sheila, who's our president, who also always pours in her heart and soul into every event. And um, there's a lot of work in the background. We're a volunteer organization, um, so everybody does uh, this in their spare time um, while juggling their work or children or lots of other jobs. Um, and I think, you know, it's amazing what, what people can pull together when they, when they put into it. But it wouldn't work out without uh, all these volunteers. Um, so thank you ever so much, Kashmira and uh, Sheila, especially. Thank you. It was a pleasure having you all together today. Thank, thanks, everyone. <laughs>